Takže dobrý večer, ja vás vítam v ďalšom pokračovaní v programu Open Studio, ktoré beží, v, ktoré beží pod záštitou ateliéru IN na Vysoké škole výtvarných umení. A našimi dnešnými hostiami, teda hostiami dnes, ale zároveň aj celý týždeň sú Anka Benera a Arnold Estefan, umelci z Rumunska, ktorí okrem dnešnej prezentácie vedú celý týždeň workshop so študentami ateliéru IN na Vysoké škole výtvarných umení. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to introduce uh, our guest from program, in program uh, Open Studio, which is running in uh, studio of Ilona Nemet, studio in, uh, on Academy of Fine Arts. Um, they are guest in today's presentation, but they are also running a workshop with the students uh, of uh, studio Ilona. Nemet. So, um, please welcome uh, Anka Benera and Arnold Estefan. Uh, thank you for introducing us and uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, we are artists based in Bucharest, um, working collectively since 2011. Um, our practice has been investigating power relations in social, economic and political context. Uh, more specifically, we reflect the confrontation of the individual with forms of institutionalized power. Um, Arnold is uh, Hungarian, uh, I'm Romanian, and we've been working a lot on these um, political issues and um, uh, topics around um, foreign policy within Romania and Hungary, uh, citizenship, and a um, lot of other um, um, projects. Uh, the first Before working together, we've been uh, collaborating on um, a project called the Center for Visual Introspection, where we did a series of workshops, educational programs, uh, public art projects, and publications between 2008 2011, uh, as you can see. Uh, introspection, maybe you wonder uh, why introspection, because we, um, the purpose was to investigate, to debate, and not just show not just do exhibitions, uh, sh show something, but engaging the public and um, create a um, dialogue. Yeah. The most important thing is just to create public for uh, content, not, uh, yeah. so after, not for artworks, uh, actually. Uh, when we closed the space, um, we started to work as artist duo. Back uh, in 2011, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So we are uh, actually partners in art and life <laughs> more than uh, 15 years. Um, uh, reflecting on this uh, partnership, let's say, uh, we created um, this project. Which One is of our first uh, project, actually. Uh, yeah, uh, reflecting on art and life and uh, questioning the re recipro reciprocal influence on our individual uh, past projects. So we calculated by that time, back then in 2012, we had uh, 35, uh, almost 35% of our life uh, together. So this percentage represented um, the part that we shared, um, that was commonly shared between us from our individual projects. And in um, 2022, we'll have 50% when we will merge our individual web pages and um, everything. The circle comes from, it's kind of intellectual marriage. Uh, the circle comes from the... But it's uh, official, we work with the lawyer with the and uh, it's somehow, it, now if you want to exhibit one of Anka's work, uh, you should ask me also to, yeah. to exhibit somewhere. Uh, the, the story with the circle uh, was that um, the lawyer said it was very difficult to um, actually to, to do such a thing because the contract uh, regards previously uh, or uh, real facts and not uh, future works. Be be what we questioned or, um, was also our future, potential future works. So that was difficult to, to put together. And uh, he said that this, um, yeah, the, the circle represents the law and the bureaucracy and um, the bureaucratic uh, lawyers are in, situated in the center and the less or... The more creative lawyers uh, work on the age of the circle. Somehow. And we were inspired by this fact. Uh, also about, um, uh, about the fact that he said this is a bit illegal between uh, legal and illegal and that's why we choose uh, to show the circle and yeah, just a technical explanation. 
the next work is uh, linked to the, um, the fact that um, most of our uh, discussions, um, also art and life, uh, was the, the history of uh, Transylvania. We've been uh, talking a lot about uh, how official history is perceived and uh, what we learned in school and uh, from our families and um, uh, yes, and we, we noticed that we, we learned different histories of the same country, actually. Um, Arnold being an ethnic Hungarian from Transylvania. This is a, an image from New York, uh, which is right now uh, showing at the Jewish Museum. Uh, the title, we have different setting actually, yeah, we, also performative mm, actions. We, uh, we've been um, recording this performance in different domestic settings, also in public space in Bucharest. And we choose uh, the most important uh, historical events between uh, uh, the Romanian, the, uh, where overlapping the Romanian and the Hungarian uh, history somehow. And uh, one of the chapter is the 48th Revolution. Uh, the second one is the Trianon Treaty. The, and the third one is the Vienna dictate in the yes, after and the, the Second World War. The less known one is the Fekete March, uh, the Black March. Uh, this is the maybe also not very known for you because um, the official files are still secret and um, uh, very. It was not made public. It was actually the most um, uh, violent clashes in Romanian recent history. Um, um, between Romanians and Hungarians, the 1990s. And we, we read here from newspapers, actually, because history books don't show this chapter. And we read the same time. Our voices uh, uh, canceling each other. And, uh, I can show you just a small part of the... Uh, covering each other up, uh, resulting in two contradictory, contradictory versions of the past, actually. We will show just a fragment of a very long time. Just to have an idea how it works in the performance. The idea is that you can't understand. Don't try to understand because you will not understand. <laughs> That's uh, how uh, official history operates, actually. You can't understand both stories at the same time. This is actually how, how truth is constructed by official history, which is never uh, purely objective, but always created as an interplay between the facts and their interpretation. Uh, the fragment was from uh, Palais de Tokyo in Paris. Uh, the next project... Uh, well, until it's loading, until the page is loading, um, I will tell you a few words. Uh, this is called Youth Soli. Maybe you know uh, Youth Soli and Youth Sanguinis are two uh, principles uh, according to which citizenship is awarded. Uh, youth Sanguinis means the right of blood and uh, Youth Soli the right of soil. Um, the citizenship is award, uh, accord, uh, it's awarding according to the birth in the territory of a state. If you are born in... In the U.S., for instance, it's uh, according to the principle of youth solely, you are an American citizen, as an example. Some countries adopt uh, youth solely, some countries uh, youth sanguinis. But so most of the European countries are, um, are working with the youth sanguinis. It's somehow related with uh, your blood type and, and your we, family. Or yeah, yeah, and we, we've been working with this abstraction and this uh, nationalistic rhetoric, which is so absurd. And um, we pointed towards a more complex and multi-layered form of belonging. Uh, what we see, it's a process of uh, unraveling uh, national flags, not of our own country only, but also our ethnic heritages. And uh, this is the, um, on the left, you see um, how the, the, and we, we unthread the flags and we make a, 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 a ball of thread, actually, in the end. We will show you a short uh, film about the process. And in the end, uh, all these uh, ethnic heritages uh, are just uh, raw material. A national symbol is uh, raw material. 
just uh, threads, different colors. It was a long process. It's, we work on this almost one month, one month, no? Yeah, each day uh, uh, unraveling. Uh, it was also quite meditating, that doing everywhere where we go, in the public space, in public transportation. Uh. We had to finish it in uh, three weeks, so we had to take it with us everywhere, because otherwise we didn't have the time for the exhibition. So just, uh, yeah. The Spanish uh, flag was the most complicated one because of the textile, I think. And the, the easiest one was the Romanian one. <laughs> the Hungarian was very difficult also to answer it. In the car, yeah. This is where we went to take a bath somewhere. <laughs> it was summer. We also took it with us. Yeah, this is in Vienna. But also we had to travel, and we went to Venice Biennale also with the flag with us. With the flags. Yeah, and, um, yeah. yeah, but the, the video part is quite long. It's almost one hour. Uh, here we, we have just some fragments. How how we work on this project. It became a kind of routine in the end, and we missed the, the process of unraveling. <laughs> when we finished it, actually. So in a few words, that was the... Um, the idea behind the project, and now we are going to show a selection of works from our first uh, first solo show in 2013 at Transit Bucharest, uh, the first time we exhibited at Artist Duo. Uh, mm, there was a time when uh, Romania was in the middle of financial crisis and uh, with a lot of foreign debts, but also, um, uh, yes, uh, a lot of... Um, it was also the time when Hungary did a very uh, aggressive uh, campaign in Romania for a potential electors in the Hungarian uh, minority region. And uh, one day we got this letter from Viktor Orban. Uh, I got it, actually. I took it from the, from the, um, from the, box, uh, from the mailbox, and uh, I, I decided to translate it without knowing Hungarian. I don't speak Hungarian, but I said, anyway, I already know what he's saying. So the title is, uh, I, I don't know what he says, but I understand. So, and I translate it in, in Romanian from, <laughs> from Hungarian. A blind translation of the letter. Imagining what uh, uh, the message was behind the lines addressed to the potential electors. And this was exhibited along with a series of other works dealing with uh, foreign debts. Um, uh, this refers to, um, it's called bilateral agreement and refers to um, a, a debt that uh, between Cuba and Romania uh, during the times when Cuba uh, and Romania had uh, a very amical relationships and um, these socialist countries uh, didn't uh, borrow money from the IMF or the other, our, other Western investors but uh, looked to each other for help. Uh, and. Um, the fact is that um, it's, a, it's about a loan that we, um, we found it by chance, researching the archives of the Foreign Ministry of, um, the, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Romania, and there is a loan of $2 billion that Cuba owned to Romania. And uh, after, 18, after 1989, when the dissolution of the Communist bloc happened, uh, Cuba refused to pay back this money, invoking the betrayal of Romania by the socialist, uh, of the international socialist cause. Uh, Cuba said that was an agreement between Ceausescu and Fidel Castro, and uh, it was based on ideology, on the socialist ideals, and not on the profit. And we refused to pay this back. As Romania changed plans and became a capitalist, uh, we accepted this was a fair argument. But you know, lately, there have been also changes in the Cuban policy towards the West. 
So we said, uh, okay, we send an official letter proposing a bilateral agreement to clear the debt uh, with the condition that Cuba should itself not abandon its socialist uh, cause. Otherwise, the whole debt will be Re reactivated yeah. um, as it was. But to, because uh, we know that uh, Obama uh, just visited Cuba in, uh, two weeks ago, we had another proposal to send another letter for the central bank them. to just to make a reminder about our uh, <laughs> and this letter was also made by lawyers with documentations and uh, but it's an artistic statement actually it's not uh, but just like an alternative way of doing politics somehow yeah uh, the next one uh, refers to um, to the 10 tons of gold that uh, have been transported to Russia for safekeeping during World War 1 uh, and was never given back it's a diplomatic issue between uh, Russia and Romania, but still remains unsolved because of Russia's political uh, dominance in the region. Uh, so we thought how Romania could recuperate the gold. And we calculated, uh, and we said... Uh, Actually, it's a, it's a taboo between um, Russia and uh, yeah, we, Romania, this issue. Mm -hmm. So we said, uh, Let's see, if one of seven Russian citizens would donate four grams of gold, approximately, we will recuperate the treasury. So we have to convince uh, us, we have to convince one Russian citizen to donate us this quantity. So everybody would convince uh, uh, Russian citizen, we recuperate the treasury. So we fi we, we've been struggling to convince uh, Russian citizen. And we finally, we found a Russian donor. And we convinced him and to donate. And we got these uh, coins, a gold coin, uh, approximately uh, eight uh, grams of uh, gram of for grams both of, of us. Gold, yes, yeah. but then the problem was how to transport it to Romania because Russia forbids the transport of gold to Romania. It's only possible from Europe, only from uh, from London, from UK. You can transport gold. So we, we arranged the transport through a friend who went to, to London and met the Russian guy. And then all this um, uh, path of the, the route of the coin is uh, marked on the, um, on the wall. We also use it as a, it's like just a national, uh, natural uh, way of transporting uh, goods or uh, money around the world. It's like you cannot avoid uh, central powers uh, yeah. dealing with this, uh, this kind of um, economical issues. What so. was also very interesting, we found a legend, we, we heard that, it's kind of legend, but we like it very much, that the October Revolution was actually financed from uh, our Romanian gold. This was the, uh, one of the um, uh, reasons why they are refusing us <laughs> um, the quantity of gold. Uh, no, but... It's also the, this is an image from Istanbul Biennale uh, where we, we participated with a project um, um, dealing with Serpent Island, which is uh, also here we talk about geopolitical um, issues between um, Romania, Ukraine, and Russia, this uh, triangle. Uh, it's around Serpent Island, which used to be a military base. Uh, this small this was, small uh, rock, rocky island in it near was, to the uh, Romanian territory, but was occupied by Russia. It has a long history because before it was occupied by Russia, it belonged to Turkey, and it's a very, very long uh, story. We will not insist on this now because it's too complicated. Uh, but so this to be this used to be a military base occupied by USSR, and uh, after the resolution of the um, after the dissolution of the Soviet U Soviet Union in 1999, uh, Ukraine inherited uh, control over the island. Uh, the the question was not to get the island back, not the territory, but. Um, they were more interested, the Romanian authorities were more interested in the uh, oil reserves and the gas which was uh, discovered around the island. Um, it was a long uh, diplomatic uh, dispute and finally Romania brought the case to the International Court of Justice. Uh, the case was uh, concluded with an uh, equidistant line. Uh, both countries were uh, uh, considered themselves winners, but the fact uh, was that um, Romania and also Ukraine probably, they sold the, um, the 
uh, the right to exploit uh, oil around the island to foreign and m multinational companies. They already sold the, res the resources before the resolution of the trial. And this was the trigger, what, uh, uh, this was the starting point for us for the project, how we can, uh, how we can approach this kind of uh, how, we complicated how we can uh, conceptualize this uh, deceptive recovery, um, actually. Because we, we got it by, back, but actually we didn't get anything back because it was already sold. So we, uh, we apply a similar procedure to, to this um, territory, and we calculated that uh, almost eight uh, centimeters of uh, soil would represent the 0 0.8 centimeters. Yeah, 0 0.8. Tiny, tiny surface. This is the surface uh, that each uh, Romanian citizen would get if the surface of the island would be evenly distributed. And we got this solution to if each citizen we will go to the island to smuggle this to smuggle uh, this uh, this quantity of land, the whole island will disappear. Uh, will disappear and um, this is an image from uh, Warsaw. Uh, this, this work was exhibited in Bratislava last year in the private nationalist. But in different format because uh, it was more complicated to paint the wall and uh, we find a, a different solution for that. Uh, actually, improving, uh, I just remember now an interesting fact, improving uh, um, Ukraine to prove that the island was inhabited in order to, to get the territory, they built some fake institutions on the island, uh, a fake bank, a fake post office, a hotel, uh, everything was fake. Uh, that was also, they also awarded citizenship to one Ukrainian citizen. Mm. Yeah, it's they invest more than one billion dollar for this kind of things, just to fake the whole uh, and afterwards they also yeah, Afterwards, they also sold the, the resources, I think, to other. Uh, the next project talks about a different uh, arithmetic of power. It uh, looks at the source of money in the art world. Um, just by, by thinking, of our uh, artistic uh, budget, we realized that the majority of our artistic funds, uh, honoraries, scholarship, residencies, and so on, come from Austrian institutions, mostly. On the other hand, Austrian companies uh, are the first to benefit from Romanian economic resources, uh, more, uh, more than natural, half, resources, natural yeah. resources. Yeah, more than half of the oil uh, now is Austrian, and um, the forest, and uh, well, everything. <laughs> and uh, OMV is one of the major Austrian companies um, which we analyzed. Activated in, act yeah. activating in uh, Romania. And, uh, uh, based on extremely advant advantageous uh, agreements actually with the Romanian state. And we said, um, we are interested to know how much they, they got in one year, for instance, 2013, and we compare it with our artistic income. And the, what you see, this uh, paper, actually is our contract. These are our- Our uh, contract with Austrian uh, companies only, our Austrian cultural institutions. Yeah. It's like you have here, culture contact, residency, and uh, different kind of- uh, uh, papers. Yeah, in 2014 we had uh, only one contract, I think. So it was not very... But 2015, it was a better year for us too. Yeah. Uh, the next one is... Um, the next project refers to the condition of the artist. Maybe, uh, you know, some of you are working as graphic designers or... Uh, also the condition of the curator who needs to support his practice or her practice through a day job. Uh, this represents uh, the papers you see on the wall represent the time we cannot dedicate to our art. So while we are doing these graphic designs and uh, other jobs, we record the movement of the computer mouse through a software. And the time that we, it's recorded, uh, eight hours, you 90 seconds. The time that... that we spend in front of the computer doing not art, actually. But in this way, we somehow convert our losing time in uh, artistic activity. 
uh, at the beginning of the exhibition, there is an empty wall with a calendar. And we send, uh, depending if we get a job or not, we are sending these papers. If we don't send any paper, that means we are working on our art. We are doing... Uh, or we are jobless and we're just we are waiting jobless. for <laughs> new commissions. Yeah, and, also, and we have now like more than 300 drawings because we started... It's almost three years of work. Three years yeah. of work, so yeah. And now also we are working on a publication, ongoing publication. Uh, out of these uh, papers, and we just adding one paper every day. Uh, and yeah, just to mention that we will stop to to do this work when we uh, we able to to live only from to, art. Uh, to live only from art. This was in uh, Rotor in um, Graz, in Graz, another exhibition where we used uh, panels of wood. Uh, for the calendar, because the surface of the wall was too small to exhibit. Uh, uh, the other, this work was uh, exhibited in transit uh, Bratislava, but also in Kiev Biennale for the first time. Um, why Kiev? Because, the, um, because we are whistling a song which is uh, related to, um, to a Cossack, uh, Ukrainian Cossack folk tune. Mentioned, mentioned in Mikhail Sholokov's uh, novel and Quiet Flows at Dawn, in which war, in the form of both international conflict and uh, civil uh, uprising, provides the epic backdrop to the narrative. But before uh, we will play the work, uh, it's a short video just to have a context uh, around uh, the subject of the work, made by uh, some activists. understand what's happening uh, in, Romania, in Romania today uh, with the Romanian forest. It was clear to EIA that we had to look at Romania. It has the most valuable remaining forest in Europe and it was widely known to be an illegal logging hotspot. We conducted our investigation by going into the forest and finding illegal logging in action and then tracking that wood. And unfortunately, very quickly, we found that a single company was the major driver behind the destruction. In just about every example of finding illegal wood in the forest and tracking it, we ended up at Schweikhofer's sawmill. When the involvement of Schweikhofer became clear to us, we decided to go undercover. I went undercover as a seller of wood. I offered them illegal wood. I said, I want to cut more than I'm allowed. Will you accept that wood? And unfortunately, on multiple occasions, always, they said, yes, you are welcome. And we'll pay bonus for any more wood that you find. We pay also the bonus if he delivers 3,000 and he signed for 2,000. If one is trying to understand what causes illegal logging, you don't have to look any further. When the market leader, the biggest company in a country has that approach to illegal logging, meaning willfully accepting illegal wood because they need it. A country like Romania doesn't really have a chance. Illegal logging finances organized crime and it finances real violence. And there are many groups and individuals that are, that are fighting for better governance, that are fighting for their forests. And they are in very serious personal danger, many of them, because of the wood that we are consuming throughout Europe, because we are buying illegal wood. And it's clear how much Europe loves its forests. They mean so many different things to, to different people. Uh, here you have the last virgin forest of Europe that house the last and, and large populations of bears, wolves, and lynx. And how can it be that knowing that, we allow that forest to be illegally cut out from under us? EIA's new report provides irrefutable evidence of devastating 
Yeah, so that was um, just to, to know a, a bit about the context. Uh, also, we think that um, probably you know that throughout history, forests uh, have also provided a natural place for people to hide in times of war and the migration, and fleeing to the forest was the only choice, actually. And today, uh, almost half of the forests are gone. So we started from this, um, from this fact, and we um, reflecting on this illegal logging and um, the fact that the, the forests were a, pla a place to hide and now uh, there is no forest, we did a performance and we recorded this performance uh, whistling uh, a song, which is uh, Where Have All the Flowers Gone? Uh, it's an anti-war anti song, which have, has been uh, recorded and performed in many different languages over the years. Maybe there is also a Slovak version of the song, I'm not, I'm not sure. I know a Polish version. But, <laughs> We are not interested only in the, what's happening in Romania, it's more about the, the global issue actually, the, how, uh, uh, how we treat the, the nature and uh, for greed and yeah. interesting that it's quite hard to find these uh, places because it's somehow hidden it you cannot see it from the main from roads the road. or it's like just we search search for this more than three months just to reach these places but it's uh, yeah it, it's more than 30 percent of the Romanian forest are in this condition because they cut it, uh, you, as you uh, go on the road, it's, you, everything is fine, but if you go a bit further, it's empty. <laughs> yeah. Then we thought uh, mm, about nature, being in a, in a residency. After this project, we, in October, we went to, to the US in California for a residency, and we've been thinking about nature and uh, if we can still perceive nature as natural. Because in California, natural and unnatural are interchangeable, actually. Uh, in this struggle to make the desert habitable, uh, nature had to be reinvented. And what is left from the wild desert has been gradually taken over by the military infrastructure. That's becoming a natural shelter for the army, as in these cases. Um, these are some images of um, uh, military bases occupying um, most of the desert. It's mock cities for uh, training centers for, for the Middle East. Here you can see a, 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 a smaller replica of uh, one of the neighborhood in Kabul. 
the Kabul in California. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, we have understood uh, this uh, landscape um, as currently and historically as an extension of the military imagination, uh, connecting uh, disparate points to look back to our home along the NATO frontier. In December, while we were there, uh, the US Navy just uh, officially inaugurated a new defense base in Romania to secure the Eastern Front. I think the second one uh, as a yeah. size after Poland. Then by searching this uh, natural landscape, uh, we found out that the first images of the American West were photographs taken by the US Army, by the the War Department around the uh, 1870s. And we just, uh, we use uh, military scrapyards, military leftovers, uh, and imprint some, uh, Im first, the first images of the, of the, landscape. Of the Southwest, of the American Southwest, uh, with small interventions uh, from, from the Nevada test site. Uh, and yeah, it's like almost sort of, 30% of, of, of uh, Nevada state is occupied by, uh, by the military today. We can show maybe some images from the scrapyard. Uh, these are some images um, from where we, uh, we took this uh, uh, military surplus. It's the city of Adelanto, the city with uh, unlimited possibilities. That's the, the name. You can find here from... Um, 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 from military scrapyards to um, uh, radio um, deposit. These are some images uh, with a cactus as antenna. Uh, there are also spy rocks um, in some regions. Yeah. So we've been um, working with uh, photography and this uh, military surplus, and we juxtapose them. And um, just by doing this research on the history of the U.S. military experiments, we got to know about the U.S. Camel Corps and the Middle Eastern fantasies in South California. Uh, apparently, uh, Haji Ali, a camel driver from Syria, was hired by the U.S. Army to lead the camel experiment in the American Southwest. But when the civil war began, the camels were abandoned in the desert because they were noisy and stubborn and uh, scared the horses and didn't get along well with the US soldiers. Uh, some were sold at a public action, but nobody knows exactly what happened to the rest. So we speculate on how the US contemporary military could have reused the animals today. And uh, we created this dromedary drone. The military pet? Why? Uh, is it's just a way to represent a military unit um, in the U.S. They, every unit has this kind of uh, patches uh, that they put on the uniforms. Uh, we have a, uh, a short film about the production of this uh, patch. Uh, this was produced in Hollywood where they uh, produced uh, the uniforms for the films, actually but also other, other um, orders. One of them, with, just by chance, we discovered they, uh, they were producing uh, the, the caps for Donald Trump before our project. <laughs> we have also an image with this, but... Not <laughs> ah, you can't show I it. lose my the internet connection, but let's... Uh, you lost let's, the internet yeah. connection? Okay, never mind. Let's uh, skip it. That video work. Okay. Uh, we also found uh, this, uh, which was uh, very interesting to us, that um, this Middle Eastern fantasy is very, very present in the U.S. And the American dream was uh, actually influenced by the story of Aladdin, this uh, folk tale about a poor guy who became rich overnight. This uh, magic lamp of Aladdin. Uh, there's also uh, camel, camel racing in India, similar to the ones in Dubai. Uh, there is a town called Mecca, uh, the festival of, uh, with harem girls and uh, the Baghdad you can stage. Find Baghdad streets yeah. and yeah. Uh, 
the, our next project is uh, which gives, somehow the, gives the, the title, title of this the presentation. Uh, presentation. It's about the, the, the hidden um, knots, um, about the secret knots. The world is bound with secret knots. It refers to, the, um, to this imaginary line dividing the north and the south. The global north and the global, global south. south. And uh, we actually we use um, two maps for, uh, for this drawing, for this installation. One of the drawings is um, called the political equator. Uh, uh, this name is uh, it's given by uh, Teddy, Teddy Cruz, Cruz uh, mm -hmm. an architect. Uh, uh, yes, an urbanist. And uh, the uh, he uh, uh, departed actually from this uh, division of the world by the Pentagon between the functioning core and the non-integrating gap. Uh, obviously, the functioning core is the north, and the non-integrating gap is the south. But uh, it looks differently a bit because also in the south there is Australia, New Zealand, and other countries. But we were more interested in this uh, geographical equator, which uh, expands, uh, metaphorically speaking, due to this uh, conflict, intensified conflicts and migration. It's not a straight line, but it. Uh, it became uh, tangled and knotty and the larger, we say. Uh, this imaginary expanded uh, equatorial line uh, dividing the world corresponds partly with the political equator mentioned by Arnold, the theory of uh, Teddy Cruz. Uh, he traced actually an imaginary line along the US-Mexico border starting from uh, Tijuana, San Diego, and extended across the world atlas forming a corridor of uh, global uh, conflict between the 30 and 36 uh, deg degrees north parallel. Uh, and we use a, a very f uh, simple uh, uh, grayish, metallish uh, thread. And, uh, very flexible at the same time. And uh, in the shape of a misery cord, it is a crochet. It's knitted by us, by hand. And if you pull the if you pull this it, side of the installation, you it can just un it's, mm, you unthread can, the whole uh, installation. Yeah, you uh, can unravel the, the barrier. In and we also this. thought that maybe uh, we should um, remake this installation every time differently according uh, the new uh, changes around the world. We also included the new fences in Europe. The, I think there are 15 in total. And yeah, this is the display of, uh, of the whole in exhibition. Los Angeles, in uh, Los the Angeles. Center for Art and Architecture, Mac, Mac Center. And this is our last project we want to present to you tonight. Uh, we call it Crossings. It's just some incidental works. It's like we didn't uh, add anything, just uh, find it on the, st on the intersections, That's on the street. It's a geographical manifestation of uh, hidden infrastructure, we say, like uh, we connections between uh, geography and... And we find Los out in uh, Los Angeles that it's a huge uh, neighborhood uh, called El Secundo, which is the headquarters of mo uh, most of the military uh, companies. It's like Boeing, uh, Lockheed Martin, uh, Raytheon. Raytheon. They also have the US Air Force, US Air Force base there. And it's like uh, the buildings are starting from here uh, until the ocean. And um, it was interesting that when we present this project in Los Angeles, nobody knew about this street. About the street. It just um, for them, it, just, it was just a new discovery. And we present them as Google photographs, so screenshots taken by Google. It's a series of uh, just, uh, yeah. This depends on chance, depends what we find. So we, we also continue this in Europe. And uh, the second one that we found was uh, AT&T, the mobile company, uh, 666 is under the logo. And they integrated, apparently, they integrated the, into the logo, the, num the 666 number. 
But it's also highlighting uh, their connection with the NSA and how they uh, selling information, uh, private information for uh, for government. Uh, institutions. It's, uh, evil attitude is somehow assumed. They assumed it. It's yeah, they are. Con <laughs> yeah, assumed. they are knew very well what they are de doing. And the, the last one was in New York, in Long Island, uh, dead end, Bank of America. Um, it's just uh, yeah. Somebody told us that um, um, if you are born in the U.S., uh, you born free. But you will die uh, with your loan or you, with, with your debt somehow yeah, because not, your life is not not enough, not enough to, to pay uh, the the whole amount of money uh, back to the bank somehow. And yeah, this is also the final uh, slide of our presentation. Uh, if you have any questions or if you if it's not clear something uh, we are here to to answer to answer your there are some questions uh, if there is no question maybe I have uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I just a very simple question, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned uh, by this flag work. I don't yeah. remember. Mm -hmm. and you was doing it like like a, a big process, like a long long mm -hmm. process. You you was making it also on the public space. Mm -hmm. And by this last work, you maybe you didn't mention it here, but in the studio you mentioned that. Um, there was some note that if you, if you, if you was the the one who uh, put that ISIS Avenue and and so on, that's why you mm, use the Google Maps. And my question is, um, mm -hmm. if you had some reaction by this uh, remaking this flag, for example, you you may, you did it in Italia, for example. And mm. ah, if people were reacting while we were yeah, uh, if if, if some people us. react on you, that what are you doing? It's flag uh, or no, no, we we didn't experience such things. Uh, we didn't experience these reactions. But uh, someone told us that uh, while it was exhibited in Romania, somebody came and uh, reacted violently in front of the screen. Uh, so in the exhibition, but not uh, no, when not we in a public space. Yeah, like why 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 are you doing this and uh, but. We all know that by chance we are citizens of uh, country. We are by chance born in Slovakia. We are by chance born in Romania. We are not linked to this, uh, to the flag, to the to the to these constructs of citizenship of but any constructs. But we also exhibited this work in in Hungary, in Budapest, and uh, uh, there was some issues about this. Uh, this thing that I legal, the, the, yeah, the illegally uh, action, what we did somehow is like, if I, if I have a Hungarian citizenship for this kind of action, I, I can go to the prison somehow. Or, but I think uh, art in this sense, um, um, it still uh, preserve uh, some kind of freedom to act in, in this sense and. and I think it's we are somehow uh, safe uh, until now. I don't know what's happened. In Someone the told us that uh, in Turkey it would be impossible to do that, this in Turkey. Impossible. Someone uh, told us that it would be impossible in Turkey to unravel the Turkish flag. That would be a stronger Slovakia, Slovakia also. You think so? We heard about a story in Slovakia with a flag, a work with a flag, but I can't remember now. When we had this exhibition, there was an issue with the flag. Slovak flag, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was uh, the part of the private nationalism exhibition in Košice. Mm -hmm. It was a yeah. uh, Czech flag. Actually, mm -hmm. it was a yeah. flag of Czechoslovakia, mm -hmm. former Czechoslovakia, and now mm -hmm. Czech flag placed on the yeah. floor. 
maybe some other questions. If there are no questions, maybe I just uh, thank you, Anka and uh, Arnold, to great presentation. And uh, thank you for coming and for attending.